science and technology and innovation, these are indispensable in the modern economy, in the modern world. Uh, the problem being that, you know, while uh, we have our uh, PhDs here, there aren't enough of us. And um, everywhere else in the world, for research to be successful, you need a complete research group. It's very important that the uh, PASA members and uh, scientists based in the Philippines are continuously in contact so we will know the needs of you know, the Filipinos and opportunities. Um, that the Philippines can have to uh, do science um, with their past counterparts. I think um, that is one of the good programs that they keep on supporting some of the initiatives of our researchers and scientists here in the country. The role of this uh, cooperation among these government agencies really is to be able to attract uh, science and technology global-based companies to set up shop here. And that is really key in terms of de developing the science and technology innovation ecosystem in the country. We really need to ratch ratchet up the appreciation, the recognition of the importance of science and technology and innovation. And um, we are all um, trying to uh, uh, attain what we call uh, the common good, the, the greater, higher, long-term good of the Filipino people. Hey. Hello, good morning, everyone. Okay, so it's already 8.03. Um, I think uh, we're now ready to start um, this webinar. Okay, I am Joel Ilo, who will be hosting and moderating this um, talk for today. Okay, and I have with me... Uh, Angie Lau, who's um, also co-managing this um, session. And we have a special guest for today um, who just uh, finished her PhD from University of Notre Dame and is also currently a faculty member of De La Salle University. So she actually just returned from the Philippines um, a few days ago and she'll be returning her teaching post um, to her teaching post at the La Salle University uh, for the next academic year. Okay, so um, let us begin with the webinar. So advances in hardware uh, in realizing or implementing novel algorithms is are really critical and has for several instances in the history of computing proven to be the case, especially in the field of artificial intelligence when progress came in bursts that coincided with developments in hardware, such as cheaper and more reliable storage media, graphics accelerators and such. Now, all those that can realize the theoretical algorithms that were developed and introduced um, before them, such as um, those ideas that um, are related to big data processing, um, implementations or ideas behind neural network or neural networking and even cloud computing. So for today, we have a guest speaker who shall shed light on the latest updates and these developments. Dr. Anne Francesca Laguna or Cheska is currently an assistant professor at De La Salle University. She earned her PhD degree in computer science and engineering from the University of Notre Dame, MS degree in electrical engineering and BS degree in computer engineering from the University of the Philippines in Diliman. So her current research interests now are accelerating machine learning, bioinformatics, and digital signal processing applications using software hardware co-design. So with her topic, accelerating memory intensive algorithms in applications using in-memory computing, let us all welcome Dr. Anne Francesca Laguna. Francesca. 
in a second. Nice to see you again, Cheska. Nice to see you again, <laughs> Joel. It's the first time that we've seen each other <laughs> after a long time. Yeah. All right. Uh, is my screen okay? Yeah, we could see your uh, slides. Okay. Uh, All right, so um, I'm here to present my work on accelerating memory intensive algorithms and applications. So we, I primarily work with in-memory computing, but I also do other uh, ways in accelerating algorithms and applications. Uh, so let me start with this quote from Abraham Maslow. Um, it says like, I suppose it is tempting if the only tool you have is a hammer to treat everything as if it were a nail. So for all these years, we've been using the same type of hardware, like, uh, like the von Neumann architecture where we have like the memory and the compute separate. Um, but it, when as like we develop new algorithms and applications, it is not enough to use the same tools that we have because we can like different jobs would require different tools um, as I'm gonna show later on. Um, so we would, would we, so what we really need to do is like to also design hardware, um, hardware for these different applications and algorithms that we're, we're developing. So for all this, for like the past decades, we were stuck with the von Neumann architecture where the memory and the compute are separate. Um, but this is, um, there, this is problematic um, in a lot of ways um, and has, uh, what do they call it? And has stopped us from develop, uh, has hindered us from developing with being stuck with us, with the memory and the CPU. As an example, like the, with deep neural networks in the previous decades, all the key, a lot of the key elements have been um, discovered in the back uh, in the previous decades, like back, back propagation was developed in 1974, perception in 1958, neural nets in 1943, but it is not until the recent decades that we were able to utilize the steep neural networks and actually use them in real life. And why is this the case? And how is this became possible? So the it, one of the key hardware components that actually helped with developing deep learning is by using graphical processing units, which allows us to perform uh, highly parallelized computations, which uh, like, for example, matrix multiplications that we were not able to do before with a simple CPU because of the lack of compute. And because of this, we had like tremendous success in tremendous um, improvements in the AI and machine learning community. But this only solves one of the problems in the whole pipeline. Um, one of the problems is, um, which is like increasing the amount of compute. But the von Neumann architecture also suffers from the von Neumann bottleneck, which is like, we need to transfer the memory the data from the memory to the compute and from the compute to the memory and back. But this prop, but this comes with a cost of like latency and energy being spent most on the data transfers um, instead of like implementing it on the compute. So if you really think about it um, here in the Philippines, we uh, there's a lot of traffic, for example. So um, so we if you have to travel from your home to your to to work and like and it will depend on like how many um how many people are like driving um, on the streets and as this um as the as there are more and more people there's like becoming the, the, there's becoming more and more problem and it will take more and more time 
to commute. So this is the same thing with the Van Neumann bottleneck. As we put the data from the memory, from the memory to the compute and the compute to the memory, as we increase the more data, the Van Neumann bottleneck takes more and more time and energy. Um, so this is a big problem as we are producing more and more data with this era of information and big data. Um, the Van Neumann bottleneck becomes becoming more of a problem. Uh, so yeah, so with the explosion of data, the Van Neumann architecture will no longer be enough and we will need to design different tools such that we can alleviate this, um, this bottleneck. Um, the Van Neumann bottleneck is not, not the only thing that we need to look at. First, we need to look at the, um, how much storage that we have, um, what are the size of our storage, and then we, the GPU is partially looking at this, but like how much compute can we implement per second? And then finally, the Van Neumann bottleneck, or like we also know it as the memory wall, where how much data can we transfer from the memory to the compute um, per second? To give a clear view of the, this problem. So um, here is an example of the transformer networks. Um, the transformer network is increasing in size, like the number of parameters increases by 240 times approximately every two years. And it is only, it is even increasing exponentially. However, with the amount of hardware, amount of mem hardware memory that we have, like in our GPUs or TPUs, it only increases by two times every two years. So it is lagging behind. So what does this mean is like, we would need bigger and bigger clusters to even just implement or like even possibly even do inference um, to use, utilize these transformer networks. And this is not sustainable. Um, and this is not sustainable. So we would need to find different ways to solve this problem. Uh, and then there's the compute limit. Um, as we've discussed before, but the GPU is also not going to be enough anymore because like, for example, here with the, the transformer networks um, increases every 750 times every two years, other um, NLP and speech algorithms by 15 times, but the Morse law um, requires, um, or like fitting the transistor size decreases by two times every two years. So we can only fit more and more transistors in a single, um, in, in our chips. And that would also mean that we would need bigger and bigger um, computing. We would need higher power, higher energy, just to be able to implement these um, algorithms and applications. And then finally with the memory wall or the memory bandwidth limit, um, so we've been working, the GPUs and the TPUs, we've been working to increasing the uh, computing limit or like the number of floating point operations per second. Um, every, and for the past 20 years, we've increased it by 90,000 times. But the DRAM or the, in the interconnect bandwidth only increases by 30 times in the past 20 years. And this is, uh, there's also a lot of limitations with this bandwidth. Um, so there should be a different point of view and how can we, uh, how are we gonna solve this problem? So as, a, as an example, as another example, with our transformer networks, we usually require bigger and bigger transformers. Um, we can also utilize transformers for longer and longer sequences. Before it's just like a phrase, but now there are transformers that looks at like, and then there was like articles, with PD articles, and then it's now getting bigger and bigger and transla translating to more like books and like looking at like multiple articles at the same time. And this would need longer, longer and longer sequences. But as we increase the sequence length, um, the execution time also increases. And this is not just because we are increasing the number of compute because we, we have a bigger transformer, but this is also 
because mainly because of the memory bandwidth bottleneck. Um, for example, Megatron only achieves about 30% of the theoretical peak um, floating point operations per second in GPU. That means 70% of the time is actually spending it on the transfer between the memory and then the compute unit. So there's this a lot of time is actually, and energy is actually being spent with just passing information. So as we solve this, uh, we are looking at different aspects. Um, so how do we determine if like an application or algorithm is limited by either the memory, the bandwidth, the memory bandwidth, or the compute limit? We typically use the refine model where the, um, so the, the, for, uh, the slanted line um, represents the bandwidth of the memory and then the, um, and then the horizontal line represents the peak flops or like how much compute or how much operations are we implementing. Um, on the left side below the bandwidth, all the applications for algorithms or not just even application, there are sometimes it's just like operations that are bandwidth limited and then there's like compute limited. So an example is um, like matrix multiplications are generally compute bound, but like stuff like softmax and like normalization are typically bandwidth limited. Um, so we usually want to be as close as possible to the, the memory bandwidth limit and the compute limit to be able to utilize them. But uh, so as we so as we design and optimize our algorithms, we would want to be as close to those limits. But because of those limits, also some of the hardware um, would take could take a longer time. So what do we do if it's more compute bound? We would usually would require more parallelism, or we could have like a faster GPU. Um, we could also do quantizations because uh, so the number of operations per second that you can have for like an int eight, for example, is much faster if you're doing rather compared to a floating point. Um, or you can change your algorithm so that you can have a lower computational complexity. For the memory bandwidth, we usually would want like a faster memory. Um, we can also use quantization and sparsity. So like there would be less transfer between the memory and the compute. Um, there's this also idea of data reuse. So it's, uh, it's like making sure that once you transfer it, you use it as much as possible before you, once you transfer the data, you use the data as much as possible and before offloading it. Um, and then the, my research mainly is on like in-memory computing. So in-memory computing, actually what happens is that we combine the hardware or like the compute and the memory, uh, memory together. So we are actually implementing the compute within the memory. Hence, we don't need to um, travel back and forth between the memory and the compute. Sometimes I, when I talk to uh, a lot of people, I just explain it in such a way, like it's like working from home. You don't need to do the, you don't need to travel, like the data doesn't need to travel between the memory and the compute. Hence, it would save time and energy. Uh, so this is not always good. It, this is also limited for like um, certain applications and not all applications would be good for that. So the idea, the in-memory computing would almost always be good for the applications with which are memory and bandwidth bound. If your application is more compute bound, um, it may or may, it may not, uh, like improving your GPU may work better than using an in-memory computing. So when we're designing these accelerators, we usually typically use a, a cross-layer design. So we look at like the applications. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the um, like transformer networks, recommendation systems, and a little bit of bioinformatics. 
Um, and then we look at like architectural solutions, like is, is it good to have like ASICs or are we, is it good to use GPUs and PGAs or like, are we using like this memory erase? Um, and then um, let's say I'm using in-memory computing. There's also like different types of in-memory computing circuits such as crossbars, content addressable memories, and then there's a general purpose CIM. Um, we also need to look at like the impacts, uh, like circuit impacts on the circuit level on like the non-idealities um, of the devices that we have. So uh, I'm not gonna talk about the non-idealities, which is like an overview of like the whole cross layer design. And then finally, we can also go like, like a much lower level on like the materials that we use on the, for the transistors that we're designing. So like SRAM or the CMOS um, we, that we typically use, uh, it, oh, we'll discuss it later. And then there's like more emerging technologies such as like resistive memory and like fair fit, like uh, fair fit um, memories as well. So uh, I with the course, I'm also gonna touch a little bit with the SRAM or um, and the FFET. So I'm gonna start top down. So I'm gonna start with the lower level um, and then go up to the application level as um, I'll be using some of these, uh, it's, Think of it as like picking what tools do I need for like a specific uh, application uh, for a specific operations. So with the devices, um, I mostly work with CMOS and EpiFit. I also have worked a little bit with the Flash, um, PCM, and RERAM. But um, in general, um, CMOS uh, is a volatile memory. So what that means is that it usually requires frequent refresh to keep the data in memory. So you really need to put like, like more voltage and always has to have power to even keep that memory in the memory device. Um, then you have faster and lower energy rates, uh, but it is also like good for like a lot of computing tasks. So you need, you can't, it is faster with writing. So if you need to write more, is CMOS is still pretty good. And it also, um, endurance is like how much memory, how much writes can you do in a device? So there's a limited, it's limited in how much, how many times can you write on a device? And then it also, but another bad thing is that it has high leakage power, which is also due to like having to refresh the data in the memory as more often. Um, the F effect, um, which is also a non-volatile memory. It's actually based on the CMOS, um, but we just put like a ferroelectric layer on it. Um, so the good thing about this is it can keep data even without power. Um, it utilizes some device characteristics, such as hysteresis, to be able to do that. Um, the downside is that it has lower and higher energy rights, and then um, it has lower insurance. So there's like, you need to write less basically with FEFET devices because writing is not really great with FEFETs. And then um, because you don't need to put power um, and it can keep data, it, just, it is, has low leakage power and non-volatile. Um, and it, as again, there are other non-volatile memories such as flash, flash SOTM, RAM, PCM, and RAM. So multiple research groups actually has like favorites among these. Um, so, uh, so you, uh, you might actually encounter like different non-volatile memories, but all in all, they're a, a lot the same, but it's on a device level that they kind of have, um, small nuances. Going to the in-memory computing units, uh, we typically use, um, different types of circuits. We continue to design like different circuits for different um, uh, purposes. So, and sometimes we just have variations of the same thing. So for example, crossbars, um, is there good for matrix vector multiplications? Um, I'm gonna discuss this a little bit in detail later. Um, and then we have like the CAMS, 
which is very good for searching. So they, in some papers, they call, also call it like associative processors, where you actually search for the contents in the memory. Um, general purpose CI, uh, computing in memory is mostly like, like other logic. Um, it's just bringing the computer really closer to the memory. And then you can also combine them into a single array. So you have like a configure memory array. So you can have like the TKM aspect, the crossbar aspect, or you can also use it as a RAM. Um, so like mix, mix and matching these in-memory computing circuits, or like these are like, as again, these are different tools that you can mix and match and like whatever, with whatever operations that an application would actually require. So in detail, like crossbars is mostly is based is a so it's a, like an array. So it's a matrix basically of like resistive uh, resistors. And um, so what it does is that it stores the it stores values as conductances or like the opposite of resistance. So it relies. Um, basically uh, on current, so either conductances or resistance, um, there are different versions. So for example, if your input is current, you're storing it as a resistance, um, your output could be voltages. But usually this would require a change to digital values using um, ADCs. So you can implement matrix vector multiplication. So your vectors will be the current and then your matrix can be stored in the switch matrix uh, in this matrix, and hence you will have an output as well. Just um, then there's the content addressable memories. Um, so we use the transistors as comparators. So we compare we'll, is basically compare B twice values. There's like different versions. There's a NAND, NextDoor, um, depends on like what you want to put in it. But um, it's basically just performing comparisons. Um, what it outputs is uh, it stores values based on different versions of the CAMs. Um, you can design different cells such that it will call um, it will either store a binary value, a ternary value. Um, ternary meaning you have zero, one, and then a don't care state. And then we have like a multi-bit. This is actually pretty new, like the multi-bit and analog CAMs, which can store like Multi-bit can store multiple bits. Currently, you can have up to like three bits, like in uh, three to four bits. Uh, four bits will have a little bit of a problem, still have a little bit of a problem, but we can store more information in a small, um, on a small piece, uh, on a small cell. Um, and then we can have analog, which is we can basically store any value. Um, why do we want to um, store more and more values in a single cell? Is that first, it means that you have lower area, which is like you can put it more and more memory in a small device. But also, it also comes with a cost. So as the as you can fit more values, it's also cheaper to implement um, to, yeah, it's also cheaper to fabricate these, um, these, this memory. So we would still want to, yeah, store more and more values in a single cell. And then um, we can also categorize content addressable memories with how it matches. So content addressable memories typically use Hamming distance so an exact match will be in Hamming distance of zero. So it will tell you what, what are the rows that exactly matches your query. And then with a threshold match, if it's within a certain Hamming distance, it will output all the rows that has uh, within, let's say two or three Hamming distance away. And then there's the best match, which is like the, what is the, um, what has the lowest Hamming distance. Um, and now I'm going back to like the application layer. Um, I would start with, again, with the transformer networks. 
Um, so the transformer networks um, relies heavily on the multi-head attention, which uses the scaled broadcast attention. And as you can see, it is mostly composed of matrix vector multiplications. It has a soft max scaling and mask as well. Um, but we're gonna focus on the matrix multiplications first. So the multi-head attention um, as the sequence length increases becomes the dominating part of the transformer network execution. And because of this, it is more amenable to crossbar arrays and can implement matrix vector multiplication in memory. It all, so, um, so you want to accelerate that part of the execution. Um, we're also implementing the softmax by uh, tweaking the ADCs as well. I'm not gonna discuss that in detail, but there's ways to um, modify the ADC such that it can also implement the softmax function. Uh, so we can, uh, what we, we achieve at least like 673 times improvement for just like a, a, a sequence length of three to the six. Um, the good thing about using cross bars is that you can, it can be highly parallelizable. So as the, um, and we can actually achieve things at oh, one time uh, because we don't need to transfer the data. We can just like keep everything on it. And then we can also increase the parallelism and it's also highly parallelized. Um, we can also use implement content-based sparse attention, which is um, we use locality sensitive hashing. Um, we use a mixed and match. We use crossbars to hash, and then we use scams to search. So we hash the, and then we store them in a cam, and then we search the cam for like the for it on what's the best. Um, so we, we were able to implement like a, some sort of content-based sparse attention. This is a little bit closer to, if you're familiar with transformer networks, it's a little bit um, closer to like we transformers and like that. So, but uh, hashing, comes at a cost. So there's like an 11% latency increase due to hashing. But if you consider um, the energy that can be solved, that can be conserved, it increases as the sequence length increases. Um, we can also utilize like the different types of like devices. So the linear weights um, usually requires non-volatile memory. Well, if we're using keys and values, we would require more frequent writes, which would be more amenable for like volatile memories. So what we can do is we can use FE fits for the linear weights since we, once they're trained, these linear weights don't need to be changed. Um, but for like the attention keys and values with every iteration, they change. So we require some more frequent writes and so CMOS would be more amenable for that. So with this, we can have a better end-to-end -end improvement. We can have good delay as well as good energy instead of having one or the other. Um, so we were able to, com we compared this with like the, there's an ML Perf benchmark and Titan X. Uh, Retransformer is like the version using resistive. We're using either CMOS and CMOS that we fit. And you were able to achieve like up to like 0.4 millisecond inference. I think this is for 512 sequence length. With higher um, sequence length, it can keep at 0.4 milliseconds um, a little bit. It might increase a little bit, but by not that much. As compared to when like you're using GPUs, you, it would increase exponentially. Um, in conclusion, with this um, accelerator, um, we can we use processing in memory to solve the memory bounded bottleneck. We use attention caches. Uh, we use data reuse. I didn't explore, um, discuss that, but we also maximize the parallelism. 
um, we use different types of attentions, and then we combine heavy fed and CMOS based crossbars. Um, next is we also used it for like recommendation systems. Um, so as I guess you're, uh, I hope you're familiar with the, with a lot of recommendation system. So it basically like Netflix recommending you what video or like movie or TV shows to watch next or YouTube, what videos to show next. Or <laughs> I don't know if the Lazada or Shopee uses it, but like recommendation system is um, used dramatically now in a lot of scenarios, um, in a lot of systems. Um, so Spotify uses it. Um, to recommend new songs. So this is one an, another direction that can use in-memory computing. So uh, recommendation system usually is uses like the filtering, there's the filtering part, and then there's the ranking part. The filtering is just like re reducing the number of candidate items. And then the ranking actually ranks as items on like which one really is closer. Um, so this, uh, the recommendation system, most of them is based on either lookup, uh, the DNN stack is actually pretty small, and then the nearest neighbor search also dominates the, um, the system. So this, if you actually look at this, the embedding chain will look up is actually a memory bandwidth limited operation. And even the nearest neighbor search is also a bandwidth memory bandwidth limited operation. So this is actually, this is pretty good in implementing and using an in-memory computing. Um, the one reason that this is requires a lot is that it requires like um, high sparse memory access, which is um, is harder to search um, the it's it takes longer for like if you're using the memory if you're accessing it sparse um, since you need to send the memory by batches as opposed to um, reading the memory sequentially. So um, we use an architecture. We have like an IMC fabric that can accelerate both the filtering and the erecting stage. We modified a little bit of the algorithm and then we use in-memory computing to uh, we use in-memory computing to be able to implement the recommendation system. So this is our architecture. Um, so most of the embedding tables um, require we use content of readable content addressable memories, and then for the DNN stack we use the crossbar arrays, which is good for matrix spectrum multiplications, and then. Um, we have like a hierarchy um, with the, which has like an other in between. And with that, we were able to achieve up to like 37 times speed up um, compared to, uh, I think 2060, um, so like a GPU uh, with this figure of merit. This is for the specific, um, this is for a specific uh, like recommendation system architecture, like algorithm um, in a specific data set. So if we have like, as I think you see here, like if you have like the movie lens or the Kaggle, it kind of changes um, with the implementation. Um, another application that we've looked at is like genome, uh, genome read mapping. So um, with genome sequencing, you typically cut the DNA into smaller segments called reads, and then you need to, um, you need to sequence that. You, you, they cut the DNA segments and then cut them, and then each small segment is sequenced in parallel. And then each of these sequence segments is called a read. These are all scrambled, so it's kind of like, um, you need putting them, you need to put them in order. And this would be like putting a puzzle piece together. So you have like a lot of puzzle pieces and then you still need to, you need to figure out where does each puzzle piece fit. 
Um, genome, genome data is very, very big. Um, the human genome typically needs like 1.5 gigabytes uh, just to store. It, that is just to store. And if they process it, it would require more and more. But um, so it does require a lot of um, data transfer, but it only requires simple and parallelizable operations, such as like string matching. So we use the seed and vote approach. So it's basically a voting uh, mechanism. So we vote, uh, so we generate the seeds, we search the, uh, we search, we need to search the memory for like the exact locations and then vote based on how much, how much matches we have on a specific locality. So this is actually very, this approach is actually very good for content addressable memories, which is really good for search and like having distance based operations. So we use TCAMs. Um, so the steps for this is that we generate the seeds um, so it, we use the shifter to just, um, to just generate it, that just need the shifter to generate the, the seeds. And then we do the seeding part or like the matching part using content addressable memories. And then we have a voting and filtering using another shifter. And then, um, we, with this work, we still use the GPU, but we're also working on just like using in-memory computing to perform like an extension, which is requires like dynamic programming or it requires a lot of multiplications and additions. Um, so we were able to do 115 times faster than other accelerators and 400 times faster than the CPU approach. It, we didn't use the GPU approach because it's actually a lot, a little bit slower than the CPU. It's because it's more memory bandwidth. Um, it requires more memory bandwidth. Um, and hence, like the CPU is actually sometimes better when it comes to certain operations such as that. So we, so what, uh, so we've looked at like different uh, applications such so as NLP recommender systems, bioinformatics. We, um, there's a lot of other applications that can use in memory computing. Um, we use it also for security, reinforcement and learning um, and other stuff. And we have like this different tools that we can use to be able to implement this applications. Um, and that's all that I have um, want to present for today. And thank you for listening. Okay, thank you, Chef. That's very enlightening for us. Now we didn't know that extens how extensive your research work has been uh, during your stay in the University of Notre Dame. So I'm really impressed. Okay, so at this point, we'll be opening our question and answer um, portion of this program. So, uh, as Angie posted earlier, um, you for those who have questions, you could post your questions at the chat box, or you could even unmute yourself. You just raise your hand, and then unmute yourself. Okay, so that uh, we all of us can hear your question and um, directly interact with our speaker for today. Okay. Okay. So okay, since nobody is asking yet, let me um, ask the first question. Okay. So understand all of this that have been. Um, researched and tested at your laboratory. Okay, I wonder about um, if there are plans or even actual efforts not to integrate your research work into the manufacturing lines of major electronics manufacturers. Um, so we're actually working what, with different hardware companies. Mm -hmm. So we have some of this research is in with global foundries. Um, if you're not familiar, they're actually making some of the chips and then with Intel and IBM, some have like different um, preferences, like Intel wants like these um, RAM crossbars. So they actually had just had a paper with like crossbar arrays using with 
HP, and then um, IBM using um, PCM with transformer networks. Um, so these companies are actually interested in implementing these and to be able to manufacture it. I think part of it, part of the work right now though, is just like making it more co like co cohesive and we'll probably see it um, in our devices in the next year, couple of years. Um, but it would probably trickle down in some devices. So it will be more specialized. Let's say you have your voice assistants will have some of these and then some of the phones will have some of these, but it, or like some computers with computers. So it's a little tricky. So what will happen is we, cause computers are more general purpose. So there, there isn't now a more recent push of like having like part of it is CPU, part of it is GPU, and part of it is in-memory computing. So how much of the balance um, would be a question for like the bigger manufacturers if we're looking at like the CPU, like CPU level, like desktop, laptop level. Okay, thanks, uh, Cheska. I just realized after I asked the, that question, I just hope that I were not uh, violating NDA. No, it's a, these have. are all published. <laughs> These are oh, all okay. published. So I'm okay with telling these. These are all okay. published. Okay. Thank you. I can um, put in like the publication. So yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, we could just uh, look at your Google Scholar uh, for the corresponding publications. But uh, by the way, you know, I, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of our president, Dr. Mario Santo Domingo, and uh, our vice president, Dr. Gladys Cofeta. Hello, ma'am and sir. Okay, so other questions from the uh, from the group. Um, the other question is about um, so you've talked about the hardware, and then it seems to me that um, some of them are implemented, you know, on top of the hardware. So there's an existing hardware, and then you just um, implemented a new algorithm over on top of it or does it need to be you know um how do you call this uh hardware and software both um being changed or refined so part of, part of the work is figuring out like what tools you need to use but sometimes this tools like is not exactly what i would need so we've been doing a lot of research with cams for example so first we were using just ternary cams and then we developed different types of matching because like, hey, I, I tell some of the circuit designers, hey, I need this type of matching. What can we do so that I could have this so that I can apply this to a specific application. And it does evolve the circuit as well. So um, it's not just the hardware telling what the software to do but it's also like the software hey i need this like the software side um working. i work mostly on the software but also telling the hardware people what to do so it's a more like a so hardware software called design um so it uh so you've seen with the camps as well we started with um ternary we we moved towards multi-bit as well since that would actually also improve like for example with dna um it would be good to fit all the nucleotides in a single cell instead of putting it on like four bits mm -hmm. um so there is uh it is a co-design it is really a co-design in such a way that these are the hardwares that we have this is what we need and sometimes it's also like nice because um when uh this is not my research but previous people when they did fe fit like the hysteresis that we find in the memory arrays they actually didn't like that before but what they found out is that it's it's, it's like a non-ideality it's like a it's something that you don't want it's an, it's an imperfection but in but when like we put in like more software people hey we actually it's actually pretty nice because like we can't keep it in memory so it is a more like so hardware software co-design. And what, what I actually enjoy sometimes is like figuring out some of those non-idealities. Hey, I can use that. 
Um, with actually for AI, a lot of these devices have noise. And with um, AI, sometimes we want noise for like regularization. So mm -hmm. up to a certain level, these are like actually good. But like if it increases up to this much, hey, I don't want that anymore. We probably need to. Um, so it is the software drives the hardware, but the hardware also drives the software as well. Mm -hmm. It's not just one sided. One, one sided. Okay. So Angie has a question here. How much will the project how much will be the projected budget to set up the whole applications for university university based research? Uh, I'm sorry again. I can't see it here, but sorry. Um yeah, Angie just messaged me personally. Um her question is how much will be the projected budget to set up the whole applications for university based research? So it if we're just like doing everything top down and mm -hmm. it will take a lot of money wow. um fabrication by itself requires like millions of dollars but i what um what we do is like we do collaborations there are companies that have the fabrication facilities like global foundries um probably tsmc tsmc or um by 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 teaming up with them, we don't need to do the fabrication yourself. Um, sometimes they actually want to fabricate it. So just like they, then they, what they do is like, they give us like smaller scale chips. And from mm -hmm. those chips, we experiment. And it's a lot easier to do that. So there, we, there's also like simulations mm -hmm. that you could do. Um, and then you just do, do project like how much um, you're gonna, how much is the energy in delay that you can do by, by doing a larger scale. Um, there hasn't been a large scale fabricated ship yet for a lot of these. A lot of these are still simulations. And, but now um, there's been more interest in like putting it more on the fabricating this, the whole systems. Um, we're doing it slowly because it does take one. Well, it does take money, and I think part of the research is like convincing that we need money to mm -hmm. do this. It's true. So I I am assuming that you are heavily supported by the industry here. Yeah. Or or are you just being supported by the federal <laughs> federal government? Um. So. What I had before was, uh, well, I'm still in the U.S. Is that um, is that it's a consortium? So multiple industries are actually we do collaborations with them based on like what interests, or what research are they interested in, and like what are their resources. Um, I think my part part of it, I try, I I'm keeping some of those connections, but I also would want to have like connections like as they come here and like we do have some places where we actually do manufacture stuff so mm -hmm. I don't know yet but that's something that I would actually want to explore yeah I hope that we could also duplicate that here in the Philippines although I don't know Intel already went out <laughs> right so we'll have to look for other uh, possible industry partners here in the Philippines or, yeah before we were sending our cheap designs to Singapore, right? And then waiting for several months yeah. just to be able to um, to use that uh, the chips and then test it out in our labs. Okay, so Gladys asked, can you comment on DNA-based computer data storage and whether it has been successfully used already? Um, I'm not allowed to talk about it. <laughs> But okay, that's efforts. the NDA. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we had an NDA, but um, there are efforts <laughs> on this. Um, it's a larger scale. So I, see. It, I actually, yeah, but I'm limited with an NDA. But um, but I can actually do it faster now. Wait, there's a there's a chip that we've been using. Okay, great. So uh, Angie asks, is it possible to collaborate with our local engineers? on this particular research area. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, we actually do have a lot of manufacturing here. And I think part of, it, it doesn't even have to be, 
Um, so the in-memory, I'm not also just, just I, I presented the in-memory computing part because that's what mostly I worked on. But along the line, I also had um, other like, like parts of the research that are more, let's say mobile, for example, um, mobile Arduino, um, like, like, like smaller scale. And that's also some part, part of the, what I'm interested in is like putting, how do you put like this big transformer models and like smaller, um, like, like devices and, um, it, it might be somewhere along the lines where I could work more with the local engineers so we have. Okay, great. So the future is really bright, but also locally. Um, Mario is raising his hand. Yes, uh, hello, uh, Dr. Laguna. So I have a question you trained abroad and now that you are going to teach in the Philippines, uh, how equipped are our universities in training, you know? our young engineers, uh, computer scientists, computer engineers, in what you've learned abroad? And uh, like, what, what are your like uh, future plans, you know, in terms of uh, like trying to improve, you know, our curricula or our facilities, you know, in, in the area of your specialization? Um, I think I, I would touch first with like a little bit of logistics. Um, I think with research, well, I start with research. With research, there has been, at least my group, not all groups are like this, but what I loved with my research group is it's very collaborative. And it's also, I think, part of like my research, the how my research needs to be, is that it has to be very collaborative. You cannot do this alone. You cannot fabricate a chip. You cannot do, the, you cannot do everything. Um, so it's very collaborative. And I think that's one thing that before when I teach here, I didn't feel as much in the community. There is still some collaboration, but we can have it. Um, actually, the part is like, I can know someone's research before they're even published. Um, so I, I can see like draft of the papers, for example. And it's something that I, we don't have if like, for example, the USD can do something like a, we can increase the citation counts, we can increase like collaborations by having those like just access with like um, people like, hey, these are like research that I've been working on, can we collaborate with this? So it's not like the crab mentality cannot work, but we should be really be helping each other like improve the research. Um, the other thing that, Sorry, <laughs> neighbors. Um, the other thing that I, with teaching is that there are more, there's been a lot of more, even with the undergrad level, they start to put in their research, like research work in some of the aspects. So it's a little bit more personalized with the, some of what they're teaching. They're teaching what like the, the basics, but there's also parts that, hey, these are like research interests and these are the new things that's happening, um, including them also part of the curricula um, actually would help like the future engineers like, oh, like they, cause these are things that they would encounter in the future when they go to the industry and not just like the, um, what we like what's like the textbook is saying so putting a little bit of that could actually help the students once they go into industry i can't think okay. of it right now i'll think of something later <laughs> <laughs> okay in terms of consortium you mentioned about consortium so your group is in part of a consortium and uh hopefully in the philippines you could also have that consortium if you wanted to have a very collaborative uh, environment. Actually, I think POS is already, um, you know, promoting this idea. So when you return, uh, you'll see a more dynamic, more collaborative research atmosphere no? um, compared to when you uh, first left to the U.S. to study. So we're uh, hoping that you'll be very active in that, um, you know, 
in that activity, in that whole collaborative um, environment. Okay, and you could also do that here in PASS as well. <laughs> Okay. Uh, that's another thing that I realized too. Like I'm in, I was in Fulbright. I had a Fulbright scholarship, so I've met a lot of people outside, also outside of my my uh, my field. So mm -hmm. from fisheries to like law and criminology. So these like kind of also opens my eyes to like other different types of research that, oh, these are things that I, we could actually use because computers um, are like enable, are like enablers. Yeah. So we actually can use it to um, help like other technologies as well. That's great. Mm -hmm. So you actually um, um, hit it in the, had very well. Um, computers are really enablers, and and that's why computer science <laughs> and data science really uh, support several application domain. I like uh, I like that you connected your presentation with a different application domains actually, and uh, hopefully, you know, in the Philippines there are more application domains where your research would find uh, you know meaning. And um, yeah, looking forward to having that. Uh, discovered no, along the way. Okay, so let's let me check the chat box if there are other questions from the group. Okay, I think everyone else is uh, pretty satisfied okay, with the uh, presentation and the conversations afterwards. So at this point, I think what we could now have is the customary um, group shot, group photo. <laughs> Okay, with our speaker for today. So can everyone please turn on your camera so that we could have a group photo. Okay. Okay. So Angie, will you be the one doing the screenshot? Okay. Okay. Let me just. Okay. Yeah. So, okay, yeah. Nava. Okay. <laughs> I am blocking it away. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Please open. Um, Herminio, Ray, JP, Ruel, John, Steph, Lomesindo, Joseph, Lamberto, and Sean, Ron. Doc Henry, hello. There, okay. <laughs> Three, two, one. Another one. Okay. Three. Three, two, one. Okay. Okay, thank you. So we'll be we'll be um posting the recorded video right uh, at the through the paase channel 